un poquito. អង្គជំរុញជម្រាបកាសបន្តក៏ចំណាយការនីតិវិធីសម្រាកការសម្រាកាជាបន្តទៅនេះគឺជាវិធីការធ្វើសេចក្តីតបរបស់ក្រុម
in its original state prior to the decisions made by the severance order. Again, the key point here is that the accused needs to know with maximum precision the size and scope of the case against him. <coughs> In this regard, Mr. Abdel Haq noted on Tuesday that the defense had not objected to the prosecution's list of witnesses on grounds of relevance similar to those that we raised on Monday. However, I would like to note that we have clearly and often objected to witness testimony in court when it threatened to stray into areas dealing with the implementation of policies not relevant to the first mini-trial, and we will continue to do that. Finally, on this point of the severance order, we certainly agree with the prosecution that contextual elements, contextual elements on a variety of matters may be relevant at various stages throughout the trial. My second point relates to so-called acts and conducts of the accused regarding the OCP submission on this principle that it applies only to written witness statements prepared in anticipation of legal proceedings, we find this position overly formalistic and ultimately unconvincing. It has always been our position that we should not slavishly follow the rules of other tribunals, but rather we should look to the underlying rationales of such provisions and apply those, that is the rationales, in a manner that is most protective of the rights of the accused before this tribunal. And in the case of ICTY Rule 92 bis, referred by the prosecutors on Tuesday, the underlying rationale is, of course, the protection of the accused against serious issues of reliability associated with out-of-court statements where the maker of such statements is not available for testimony, and that the ICTY Appeals Chamber took pains to emphasize in the Galich case that written statements prepared for the purposes of legal proceedings are especially problematic, that does not exclude the possibility that other types of documents or statements are by analogy, based on the same rationale, equally troubling. For example, unsourced press statements or any number of statements made by individuals with motives adverse to the accused, whether or not, as I've said, such statements were taken by investigators in anticipation of the trial. In any case, we must acknowledge with approval, I should add, that the OCP has conceded that much, if not all, of its submitted documentary material is only of a corroborative nature, and we're grateful for that clarification, but we would be remiss not to belabor this point to a certain extent, given our client's right to test evidence against him through, for example, confrontation with the makers of adverse statements. <coughs> I believe I've said more than enough on this point, so I'll simply invite the Chamber to closely review all of the materials submitted by the OCP and, as it must, adopt an approach that is most protective of our clients' fundamental rights. And to my third point, that is reference to these proceedings as a mini-trial, Your Honours, we submit that there is nothing inappropriate or offensive about the use of that term. All of the parties, I believe, have used it at some point. Commentators and the press regularly use it. If I'm not mistaken, members of the chamber staff have used it. Indeed, yesterday morning, the national prosecutor used it. At least that's what came through on the English channel of my headset. So I think it's fair to say that mini-trial has become the accepted shorthand version of case 002 stroke. Zero one, which obviously does not roll off the tongue. Simply, it is an accurate description of these proceedings, which are clearly a miniature version of the trial that was originally contemplated. It is our view that the OCP cannot seriously attempt to limit our use of language in this court to such an extent. If and when we offend, the Chamber has proven ready and willing to slap our wrists. Regarding torture-tainted material, my fourth point, just a brief word on this. Of course, there are limited uses for torture-tainted evidence. And this is recognized by the CAT, and we have acknowledged that already. Uh, if a full briefing, if a full ventilation of the issues is required, as suggested by the OCP, 
more than that to assist in that regard. And just to clarify something that Mr. Lysak mentioned yesterday, we did not submit, we did not submit that all biographies were taken under torture. Rather, we stated, and I'm quoting now from my notes from Monday, that these documents which were clearly made under torture, threat of torture, or in any event, under the type of inducement or coercion prohibited by Rule 21 3, therefore they should be treated as confessions, and we simply stand by that In any case, based on its previous remarks on the issue, we have full faith and confidence in the chamber that we will proceed in a manner consistent with the CAT, and our client's rights, and we will deal with the probative value, if any, of any admitted material in due course. My fifth point with respect to the DC CAM documents, contrary to the OCP submission, the defense has not given up this point. We have not given up the point. We have made our oral submissions at the last document hearing. We have followed up with further written ones. That's document E1. Stroke 39.1, stroke 1, and we are now simply awaiting a decision of the chamber. However, I do accept my Belgian friend's assessment that the defense efforts in this case are largely, if not completely, to use his words, futile. My six points regarding witness names, as the naming of potential witnesses in this case, a distinction must be made, must be made, on the one hand, between disclosing the name of a scheduled witness whose testimony has been confirmed by the chamber and where revelation of that fact would have some negative impact, versus, on the other hand, the mere mention of a name of an individual who may have been proposed by a party. Individuals have public roles beyond their participation, potential or otherwise, in this case, and their names will often be mentioned in passing, as I might add the prosecutor did on Tuesday with respect to Dr. Kissinger. But we, of course, have called for his testimony in this case, and that is already a matter of public knowledge, but it does not follow from the mere fact but the chamber has assigned Dr. Kissinger a pseudonym without actually assigning him an appearance that the mere mention of his name is problematic. And this goes equally for individuals who may have been scheduled for testimony should their names be mentioned in such a way as to not reveal that fact. So I repeat our call for Uk Nupunshion, Im Chen, Mies Mut, Ornem Hong, a call I made on Monday, and I note that by so doing, I'm revealing nothing, nothing about this chamber's intentions uh, with respect uh, to the hearing uh, of those witnesses, uh, simply uh, stating uh, that we would uh, like to hear them, and that uh, cannot be considered uh, uh, as something that should be kept uh, 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 public. Uh, My seventh point, uh, very, very briefly, uh, with respect uh, to uh, audio and video recordings, uh, and this uh, simply uh, in reply uh, to something uh, Mr. Lisak uh, said uh, yesterday, uh, uh, I believe uh, I corrected uh, myself uh, on uh, Monday, uh, and I referred uh, to uh, the uh, producers such footage rather than the makers with respect to the audio and video recordings of the accused. And finally, my eighth point, as to the quality of the work accomplished by the OCIJ, I simply stand by my original submission that any reasonable observer of the investigation in this case too would conclude that that office, under its previous leadership, I might add, was a manifestly biased institution despite the presence in that office of certain capable staff members. Simply, the OCIJ's previous judicial scrutiny must be discounted in the manner we have suggested to date. And I hope I haven't taken too much of your time unless Major Sanarun or my American Dutch friend has anything further to add. I will see the floor to Mr. Farnes. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to everyone in and around the courtroom. I'll try to speak slowly, even though I have a lot of ground to cover. First, let me begin uh, with where Mr. Lysak began yesterday, and we do indeed uh, confess error with respect to two of the, uh, the documents. The error is mine and mine alone in that 
one exhibit number is being used, and then they're referring to uh, air numbers that are part and parcel of the same document or the same exhibit number that contains three different documents or two different documents. Uh, there's where the confusion lied with us. Uh, when I was collating the documents, I made this error, and therefore I do extend my apologies to the prosecution, and we will endeavor to keep in mind that when a document has, when more than one document has the same number, that is because of the way it was processed into the case file. Uh, we don't think that this is a proper way of doing things. We think that we should have a separate uh, case number, or, uh, exhibit number, uh, to avoid confusion, but as opposed to different air numbers or relying on the air numbers, but such is the case. With respect to one document, IS 3.5, we do note that while it is a biography, it's listed as a biography, it also contains some photographs from BC camp. And again, uh, that was part of the confusion. So we extend our uh, apologies to the prosecution and we certainly uh, ask for the trial chamber's indulgence. We will endeavor in the future to be uh, more vigilant uh, and diligent. That aside, Mr. Lysak gave a brilliant uh, performance yesterday, testifying at one point giving a closing argument at one point, and then it invi in fact inviting your honors to accept your findings of fact from case 001 as proved facts in this case. And he did so by saying, well, your honors, you know from having heard Doik that this is what happened. This is the way it is. And it gave the appearance that well, this is well beyond adjudicated facts. You may recall, Your Honors, that we had some major concerns with the trial bench as it's presently constituted because it had heard the evidence in 001 and now it was going to rehear the certain evidence for 002. We filed submissions. In fact, the first submission was filed by the incorrect team, and then we followed suit. The trial chamber made its decision, and in doing so, we have been left with the impression, and I believe it's a correct impression, that the trial chamber will endeavor to give us a fresh trial and to hear the evidence anew, as opposed to relying on evidence and where the prosecution looks to the trial chamber and says, well, you know, Your Honor, since you've heard us from the first case, that this is a proved fact. Why would you want to bother in listening to the defense? And that's what I got from Mr. Lysak yesterday. In not so many words, but in fact, that's what he was doing. And I will explain in more detail later when I talk about transcripts of testimony. Basically, the prosecution's argument was, well, this is a civil law system, low threshold of admissibility. Your professional judges, the OCIJ, the Office of the Court Investigative Judge, did an objective investigation, and I concur with the Moon Chair team. There were anything but objective. I think Judge Lamont made it quite clear he wanted inculpatory evidence, not exculpatory. We filed a motion to have him uh, recused and dismissed, but we saw nothing in that investigation that demonstrated that they actually did an investigation. What they did was a validation of what the prosecution had prepared in their, uh, initially for them. And then when you have an employee of the prosecution go, go on and to work for uh, the OCIJ, that shows you how much objectivity was involved in that case. And in filing, in making certain submissions, even the core investigative judges admitted that only they need to be objective, but their staff need not.
Yet it is their staff that go out into the field. It is their staff that, that supposedly summarize accurately and correctly the statements. And I have a news flash for everybody. We're not in France, where they have trained judicial officers, judicial police, who know the procedure, and everybody comes from the same culture, and the event occurred in an uh, isolated area. So we have investigators from all over the world uh, who have different practices, different habits, and that's why we maintain that it's not objective, and that's why you need to be vigilant, Your Honors. The prosecution argues, well, this is a, a JCE, it's an overarching JCE. Of course, the, the defense is trying to keep you from hearing certain evidence, we're trying to build a wall, we're trying to tie hands. In fact, Your Honors, it was you, Proprio Moto, that decided to sever the cases. We made no application. We concurred with you, in fact. In severing the case, I assume, and I think that everyone in this courtroom would agree with me, it wasn't done lightly. You thought about it, and you took everybody's, everyone, every, all the parties' uh, interests uh, into consideration. If the trial chamber intended to try the entire case or have all of the evidence of case 002 pumped into, uh, dragged into, snuck into, call it what you will, into 002 slash 1. No. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, so if you will give me 10 extra minutes, I will slow down. Okay. Well, it's always worth negotiating. Uh, my apologies, Your Honor, and I am getting a little bit exuberant, uh, so I will try to slow down. So, let's begin, uh, and I'll go uh, slowly. Uh, Your Honor, I... I invite you to look at your severance order, and in particular, paragraphs 6, 7, and 8. In 8 in particular, though it is directed towards the civil parties, it is pertinent to all of us. And you state in, uh, in this decision of the severance order of uh, 22 September 2011, in paragraph 8, that the number of witnesses, experts, and civil parties to be called by the chamber will be limited to those who, uh, whose proposed testimony is required for the first trial. Separation of proceedings will enable the trial chamber to issue a verdict following a shortened uh, trial. And that's what I want to focus on. You say a shortened a shortened trial. Safeguarding, safeguarding fundamental interests of victims in achieving meaningful and timely justice and the right of all accused in 002. So you're balancing. And I assume, Your Honors, when you limited the number of witnesses, your intention was to limit, to limit the evidence that was directly related to 002 slash 1. The prosecution says, well, gee, we, we, we made this annex for the entire case, and we're working off that annex. Suffice it to say, Your Honor, when you decided, when you decided to sever, it was uh, the prosecution's duty and obligation to go through their annex and edit it. Did they? No. How do I say this? Ba Yesterday, Mr. Lysik made some admissions. Boy, here's a, uh, a, a, a film or a video, not relevant for 0021, but okay, you can defer making a decision on that. Why is it in then in, in any event? We want to help the trial chamber in its endeavor based on its decision to sever the cases, to sever this case. Obviously, the intention was not to cut off any part of the closing order. 
That wasn't the intention. But the intention was to have 002 slash 1 as a self-contained trial that would be manageable. It cannot be manageable, Your Honor. We submit if you're having documents that are dumped into the, into the file, uh, into your lap, and you're being asked now to figure it all out. The international co-prosecutor two days ago read from uh, our own motion and quoted relevance. Let me go back to that, Your Honors. And this was in a filing uh, that I made, that we made, on behalf of Mr. Ng Shari, uh, our objections to the admission of certain categories of documents. 6 September 2001, E114, paragraph 11. The pertinent part. Relevance has been defined as, quote, evidence that tends to prove or disprove a material issue. In other words, evidence is relevant if it is its effect is to make more or less probable the existence of any fact which is an issue, i.e., upon which guilt or innocence depends, end of quote. And then Judge Shabahuddin, who was on the appeals chamber, then goes on and served at the ICTY for many, many years. He goes on to say, quote, evidence must be relevant. That is to say, it must tend to make credible a fact which has to be established at trial, which has to be established at trial. It is not relevant that alone suffices uh, to exclude it. Okay? So it has to be relevant. So the, co the international co-prosecutor says, well, clearly Mr. Ng Sari has filed a motion and has objected to, the, uh, to being here because he was pardoned and he got an amnesty. And why? What's wrong with having this document? Well, let me explain it so that we can all understand, and hopefully it will be understood on the part of the prosecution. Why is this relevant to your case? Is this an issue? Mr. Ng Shari did indeed receive a pardon and an amnesty. That was never an issue. What the issue was, whether it's applicable and to what extent in this particular institution. So is this relevant? No. Is it nice and useful to have in the case? Well, it may be nice, but is it useful? No. Why clog up? that uh, the file, in this case, with that useless information. So, do I care or do we care if that piece of evidence is in? No. It means nothing to us, that particular piece of evidence. But I'm raising it as an example. Or, for instance, they have a report, a rogatory report, that says, we, the investigators, X, Y, and Z, went and oversaw the arrest of Mr. Ng Sari or Nguyen Chia or what have you. Why is that important? Is their arrest an issue? In this case, no, but I ask you, why haven't they taken the time to sanitize their, uh, their annex and to only proffer uh, documents which are relevant to the case? We submit the reason they don't want to do that is they would like to, say, to have everything in from 002 and then in the use uh, what they say, well, it, it's useful for other things. This is contextual. And then, in the event that there is no uh, case beyond this particular case, because that's what they perceive, that's what they admit in their own writings, then they would be able to use that for some other purposes. We are saying, in order to have this case manageable, we have to have manageable amounts of information that are relevant to the case. No one is trying, and no one has ever tried, to prevent the prosecution from putting on its case, if indeed it has a case, which it claims it does not, because it says that it's the trial's case, and that you are the ones that are uh, driving the process. Now, let me go on, Your Honors, to the next point about professional judges. Because I think 
you know, I, and I must confess, when I first went to The Hague back in 2001 and I heard this term professional judge, I couldn't understand it. Seriously. Because I came from a country where our judges are professional. So it took me a while to figure it out. Because I also saw judges who were diplomats and academics. In my, and in my opinion, some of them are not necessarily professional because they don't come from the profession of being in court, either as a prosecutor, as a lawyer, having worked in the field, but merely their classroom academics or diplomats that do something other than being professional judges. But, be that as it may, I guess the term means you're not lay people that you can receive all of this evidence and somehow keep it separated what is admissible, what is not. And so I thought I would invite your honors to a transcript from a recent case at the ICTY because whenever it suits the prosecution, they look to the ICTY as if that is the uh, the place where all the law comes Good. from that we must use in this particular tribunal. And so I, uh, I provided your honors with a copy of the transcript from the Paradinai case. You should have it there. And I'm referring to the 18 October 2001 transcript in the case of prosecution versus Ramush Haradinai, and I'll spell it, R-A-M-U-S-H, last name Haradinai, H-A-R-A-D-I-N-A-J, and the case number is IT-04-84-BIN-1. And capital T for trial. So, in this particular case, the prosecution, Your Honor, is about to give opening statement and they want to refer to certain books. I refer to page 20, uh, 224, and this is what Judge Moloto, who is from South Africa, who was actually a judge and, and, and was a member of the bar since 78, and had practiced law, but was a judge uh, uh, in South Africa and has been at the ICTY since 2005. This is what he has to say. Let me just make a general comment. I find the opening to verge on testifying and introducing exhibits which are not marked as exhibits yet, but which are documents that make an impression in the mind of the chamber. And to the extent that this and to the extent no. that this no, point no, there no, is now a dispute no, about no, the authenticity no, and, no, and the provenance, no, the relevance of the book no, that you're about no, to refer no, to, no, the chamber no, feels constrained no, to apply no, the rules no, of admissibility no, before no, it allows no, you no, to continue no, talking no, about it. No, now I'm um, on two, uh, page 225, line one, you got to authenticate it. You got to bring in a witness to say he's the author of the book and all the requirements for admissibility because we, the chamber, cannot accept that, uh, that we hear what you are going to say only to throw the book out later. The book may be out, but the mind, it's still in the mind. And the purpose for admissibility is to make sure that the mind of the chamber is not colored by what might turn out to be inadmissible. Mr. Rogers, the prosecutor, then says at some point, same page, line 11, he invokes the usual mantra that we often hear in these international tribunals. Your honors, of course, are professional judges that are able well able to take away from your mind such things that may or may not in due, cor in due course be ruled to be admissible. And for that reason, these documents and documents like it are normally permitted to be opened during the course that goes on. Now let's, fo let's follow on. Next page, page 226. This is what Judge Maloto now 
responds to this, the mantra, your professional judges. And now I'm on page 226, line 11. Everyone has been copied, your honors, so everyone can follow along. And I apologize uh, to those who cannot read English. This is the best we could do. I, found, I thought of this as an afterthought this morning and this up. Can I just make a few comments? First of all, I just want to say I accept that the chamber is Composed of professional judges who are able to disabuse their minds of things that are irrelevant. However, it is also constituted of human beings. And you will realize that in the guidelines that they have been given, the whole question of MFIing documents is being forbidden. Precisely for that reason. If you are going to get one document, you may be able to disabuse our minds. In other words, if there's only one document that you're, that you're admitting, we can set that aside. And now listen, and this is the crux of our arguments, Your Honors. If we are going to get 150, in our case here, 500 or 5,000, 50,000, but if you were going to get 150, it becomes pretty difficult, humanly impossible to do so. And therefore, this chamber intends to keep to a very bare minimum any documents that come in which may later have to be thrown out. So, so much for professional judges being able to just absorb everything. Here we have a judge saying, well, not so fast. And we say the same thing, Your Honors. We're not suggesting that you're not capable, but you're going to be inundated. And, and I propose uh, that we first hear that some of these documents can come through the witnesses, and then later, if necessary, applications can be made. That's the preferred approach that has been used at the ICTY, uh, let, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as I know. With respect to regulatory, we we uh, we have uh, my remarks concerning the rogatory the rogatory letters uh, the, uh, the rogatory letters yes uh, with respect to D nine slash nine one slash thirty here for instance you we have a summary from the investigators concerning what they learned from witness Wong Norin. He testified, so I don't think I am divulging Why is this necessary? He's testified. His testimony is the evidence. Why is this evidence? That it's is it used, is it being proffered as a supplemental? But along with this, there is also another a uh, witness summary, and in fact, that it's not only a summary, but it is well divided into evacuation of people from Phnom Penh, chain of command, the re-education of, uh, of intellectuals, and so on and so forth. Is this witness scheduled to appear? If so, why do we need it in at this time? If not, does this not amount to a statement, especially since the prosecution is saying this was given under oath, and therefore it can come in, we don't need to cross-examine this witness, you can accept everything that is being said in here, uh, because we say so. We submit, no, not at this time. If the witness doesn't come in, he's not scheduled to come in. If the prosecution thinks that they need this information in, because without this information, they will not be able to prove their, uh, their case, then they can make an appropriate submission in due time. But at this point, we say it's premature. And that has been our approach all along. We're not trying to exclude, but we're saying there is a time for everything. Now let me get to transcripts, Your Honor, because I think I might be running out of time, and this may take a little bit longer than I anticipated, because I do have actually 
and I provided everyone, including your honors, and uh, my colleague informs me that I perhaps I should have asked permission uh, before providing it uh, to everyone and to yourselves uh, for leave to go into these documents. Uh, I apologize if leave should have been sought. The reasons I'm using, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to hard copies is because it's rather difficult to follow along sometimes. Along with this transcript, this is a transcript from, again, the same case, same case number, Different day, day 24, August 2001. I've also provided you with some of the rules of evidence from the ICTY because they're being referenced in this transcript and for your convenience, Your Honor, should you wish to make reference to those rules, they're there for you to, to look at. That goes mere, uh, for mere convenience so you don't have to look them up. Uh, now, in this particular case, the whole issue is whether a transcript of a witness who happens to be in court at the time but refuses to testify, who incidentally, and for disclosure purposes, was my client, uh, should his prior testimony in another case come in and in this uh, in what I have presented to you in no, pages, I your honors, uh, 453 of the transcript in this case, to 462 is part and parcel of an oral decision that was issued in this particular case. Uh, for time purposes, I will not read as much as I wanted to read, but I will give a summary uh, of what had happened which is, it can be gleaned from, from the pages that I provided. The witness came, managed to answer a couple of questions, and then refused to answer any more questions from the prosecution. The prosecution then asked the gentleman whether in his previous testimony he had been truthful and honest, the answer being yes. The witness then indicated further that he no longer wished to testify or he was unable actually to testify for a variety of reasons. So for all intents and purposes, the witness was unavailable. Even though physically he was there, the evidence of which he had in his brain and was able to provide to the court, he was unwilling to, to share it. And therefore, the prosecution was stuck with uh, having called the witness, not getting the testimony in, but then relying on the witness's prior statements and prior testimony that he had provided under oath. So that's the scenario. And in this instance, you will see, Your Honors, because I'm running out of time, that what the court held, and it goes through pains to explain the interplay of the various rules. In this instance, effectively, the judge at the end, allows the transcript to come in and allows the parties the opportunity to cross-examine. And at the end of the day, what happens is the transcript does come in and they're invoking various rules. And because we have limited time, I will just go to page 459 and just read a couple of portions from here going on to the next page. Because we're dealing with 92, rule 92 at the ICTR, uh, ICTY, but in this case, you're talking about 92 tur. 92 tur is concerned with the mode in which a witness gives evidence, whether entirely viva voce, or whether his evidence in chief may be admitted in written form if a witness is present in court available for cross-examination and attest that the statement or transcript 
in question adequately reflects that the witness would say if examined. In other words, Rule 92 Charlie is not intended to replace the oral evidence of the witness. And let me give some background. Because at the ICTY you have cases that are related, such as, for instance, the Srebrenica case. There have been four separate or five separate cases. The panels constitute of different trial judges. You have a witness who testified in case number one, which would have been Christens, then Blagojevich, then Popovich, then Tolomic. Usually, the witness comes in every single time and begins to give evidence from the beginning. If the prosecution or the party who is tendering the witness wishes to save time because we work under time constraints, they may make an application under 92 tur, which allows the prior statement or the testimony to serve as direct examination after having asked a few questions such as did you testify, did you testify in the oath, were you truthful, maybe supplement a few questions, but the testimony comes in and that becomes part of the prosecution's evidence for this witness on direct examination. And it is based on that evidence that then the other party gets to cross-examine. That was the purpose of this rule. Here in this tribunal, we have different rules. Yes, it's a civil law, but we're really not in the civil law land anymore. We're sort of in, in between. We've crossed over enough, in my opinion, not far enough, but enough into the Anglo-Saxon adversarial system. No offense, I'm Judge Lovern, but I think we're in that, in that part. Okay? Your honors have, for better or for worse, delegated some of your authorities to the parties. Some of us welcome that, some of us find it a bit uh, disconcerting. But the prosecution, for instance, is entitled to lead. They're leading the witness on your behalf. Now, if we admit a, a, a statement a, a, or a transcript in, and the pro, is the prosecution willing to concede that this is their evidence for this witness for direct examination purposes? If that is the case, now we're definitely into adversarial And this is why we have some problems. But more importantly, Your Honor, if the witness is coming to give evidence, let them give evidence. If the prosecution wants to use portions of the evidence from the previous case as part of the testimony, fine. Then they should identify which portions for what reasons, so we know. And then they're not entitled to go into those areas. That would be their direct examination. In doing so, Your Honors, however, I must caution, I must caution you that we have been asked how much time do we want for Doik. Now think about it. But this is something that I, at 3 o'clock this morning, it was one of those eureka moments when I realized one of the problems. You're asking us, Your Honors, how much time. His transcript from 001 comes in, in its entirety, basically. All of his statements. They come in. Then the prosecution testifies. In the meantime, you're asking us how much time. And if I say one or two hours, then that means in one or two hours, I have to confront the witness with not only what he says in court in this case, but everything on 001. Because if I don't, the prosecution will say they did not challenge, they conceded, and as Mr. Lysak said yesterday, you all know it already. You already decided on this issue. And there lies the problem. And so I think it's a matter of, we have a major problem. I suggest that, and we submit that if a witness is coming, let's hear the witness's testimony. If we need to go into a part of their prior testimony, we can do so. Normally, as I've indicated, it's done only for confrontation or for rehabilitation. If it's a matter of saving time, then it should be a limited portion. It should be identified. We should know in advance so then the parties are on notice so they know exactly how to schedule their own uh, examination of the witness.
Is this part of the rules? No. Are we able to do this and safeguard everyone's rights? The answer to that is yes. And I think that we can be creative enough so that we just don't throw everything in and say, well, uh, sift it out later, but rather be very judicious in what we admit at this point in time. In getting to transcripts, Your Honors, one of the transcripts that, being, that is being proffered is that of Goldstone. Now, Judge Goldstone, or Justice Goldstone, who is a justice on the Supreme Court of South Africa, who went on to become the prosecutor for the ICTY, a lecturer, and most recently he was involved um, on a commission concerning uh, the events in Gaza. And I won't go into that, but be that as it may, he's testified here in Doi on matters that are utterly unrelated to this particular case. It has nothing to do with the case. I enjoyed reading his testimony. It might be relevant for some other purpose down the road, maybe for the next uh, another segment of the trial, but for zero, zero, uh, two slash one is not relevant. So why is the prosecution putting it in at this point in time? And it can't be, well, it's for, because it deals with the joint criminal enterprise. It has nothing to do with the joint criminal enterprise. And it's not just that. You have other, you have other transcripts. You have transcripts of, of experts or historians such as Chandler, Nye Chandler. Okay. If these witnesses, do, if these individuals, these individuals, correct myself, if these individuals do not come in and testify, what they're asking you to do is accept their testimony. It's a, and, and then not only accept your testimony, but in effect, are you not accepting all of the facts that you have made on the basis of having heard, heard the testimony from 001. Yeah, I may be out of time, so I might need a, a, a couple of minutes to wrap up. So with your indulgence, and I apologize, I should have asked this, made this point earlier. Uh, but here's the problem with us. If they don't come in, to be confronted, then essentially we're stuck with their testimony. They say, they, the prosecution, well, they've been cross-examined. They have been cross-examined in another case. I see the, the shaking of the head, but if you look at their submissions, Your Honor, they're saying statements and transcripts should be, should be treated alike, and the statements taken by the OCIJ are under oath. Testimony is under oath. They've been cross-examined. That's what they've said in their submissions, in their written submissions in the past. And that was the position I heard yesterday. And so, but if a witness, such as Chandler, a witness from 001, if he's coming in, why do you need this testimony from 001 at this point in time? Why is it relevant? But are we not getting ahead of ourselves? If the, the, the individual is called, he can uh, be cross-examined or questioned, and if necessary, you can refer to part of his, uh, his testimony. If for time purposes, we are not unable to cover everything because of time limitations. And a segment, a discrete segment of his testimony, which does not go to acts and conducts of the accused, is necessary for the narrative. Then they can, uh, the prosecution of the civil parties or any one of us could seek leave to have that portion admitted, very targeted, it doesn't prejudice anyone, and everybody is unnoticed. And while the witness is here, if necessary, he can be cross-examined. If the witness becomes unavailable, as my witness did in the Haradina case, then we can cross that bridge when we get to it. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. And that's why our fundamental position, so we are very, very clear, because yesterday I sat here, I sat here patiently, and I wanted to object, but I did not object. But I, I got the appearance as if we are some sort of dark force of trying to limit 
the existence of S21. We're trying to exclude all of this testimony. We're trying to deny this and that. We're not. What we are about and what we're submitting your honor is that since you, Pro Mota, decided to uh, limit the scope of the first case for efficiency purposes so you could have a quick or a speedy judgment. You cannot do so unless you, it, it is targeted. And so be very judicious in how you accept the evidence at this point in time. I think we, uh, these hearings, and I, can, uh, and I will agree with the civil party yesterday, I think these hearings have taken a life of their own. I think initially it was, are these relevant and to what extent, are they pro, you know, where are the provenance? And now we're into trying to make argument about why the documents prove guilt. That's what was done yesterday. And so, Your Honor, take a very judicious approach. We're confident that if you look at all of the, uh, the submissions that, that have been made, and if you look in particular to the, the transcripts from the, uh, the, uh, the oral decision that I've submitted from the Haradina case, you will see that the answer lies there. No one needs to be prejudiced, but we want to make sure that we have a targeted trial that is manageable, that when it comes time to drafting the closing argument, we know exactly what is relevant. I think it's insufficient for the prosecution to stand up and say, well, you can defer making a decision on this piece of evidence. They should have done that in every single one. In fact, what they should have done is sanitize their annex to say, this is only what we need. And and lastly, let me make one other point uh, as I sit down. When you look at the prosecution's annex, Your Honor, it is virtually impossible to divide in many instances why a particular document is sought to be admitted. For instance, you know, my client, you know, the fact that he was, uh, was reported that he got an amnesty. I, I can't figure out. I'm trying to get into their head. I, I, just, I just can't. can't figure it out. It's not, it's not readily available. Yesterday, Mr. Isaac, in making an offer of proof, which turned into a, uh, submissions and closing argument, attempted to do so. Perhaps, perhaps, had the prosecutor, and I'm, this is not a criticism, but perhaps this is something that the trial team should consider, but had the prosecutor in his, in his uh, annex been a little bit more generous in the information as to why exactly, not just it refers to this paragraph, but kind of give a little narrative, a short paragraph, that would allow the parties to figure out what exactly they're driving at. Perhaps we will not be making overarching objections. We make more targeted objections. It's not a criticism, but it's the nature of the, of the beast. In any event, let me uh, end by thanking the trial chamber for extending my time and for uh, participation in listening to my uh, submissions this morning. Thank you very much. អរគុណលោកមិត្តវិជាបន្តអង្គប្រសាសន៍ <coughs> ទៅលើចំណោយរបស់សហព្រះញ្ញាហើយនិងខ្ញុំបាទសូមលោកប្រធានអនុញ្ញាតឲ្យសហព្រះតារបស់ខ្ញុំធ្វើសេចក្តី <coughs> ជាពិសេសទាក់ទងទៅលើការបដិសេធចំពោះឯកសារទាំងឡាយដែលបានដាក់ដោយសហព្រះញ្ញា
chấm hồ robot dương khi nhóm mình men miền này thả cướp ai cả sao từng ở đại bàng đã đòi sạp địa nhà dương bạn được sạch chẳng xong được tì có bàn tay vì miền ai cả sao môi chấm luôn đại dương vô tham mình cho bẹp bòn từ nâng ai cả từ nâng sạp mà cao địa bên đi hay ai cả sao từng ở nu cua tài lược sầm rạp từ prapa nơi bay cào ấy đại mình từ dùng một prapa nơi bên đi rước của ai cả sao môi chấm luôn tiết đại mình miền phải giao sầm rạp đường cái đây hay đại sạp địa nhà bàn lược dục màu đã sắm rạp cả đỉnh đòn được pin đi đã thôi ao biển cả lồng bác nông cả chậm nái pin về lìa đảm bảo chậm tọa. Chợ là hay có mối đại kiểm mờ khơi chìa rùm cứ tha cá vô khoai cầm đất kia rồi viên xả về nhà nâng xích cái đây đây đi cá sắm rạp rồi bỏ on chậm nôm chậm rẻ lệ y mà rồi mà phải buồn chợ tôn tôn đại ca sầm rạch bằng bài cách đồng nai đi đồng nai cái này tệ vị thí anh đã làm tạm vị thiên bài sầm bồn bồn stone pi này vị thiên tây khồng đại bài nhà này vị chia cần lư thông đại thừa ao xã bia nhà vô khơi thà rồi ai cả xa tiền ó vị tài ta cho bẹp bòn tới nâng sầm nông rừng sơn sơn pi này còn tại đại lại ca bằng bài nâu cách này tệ vị thí robot on chấm chấm rẻ nếu bên này cứ bàn thưa ai ai cả xa môi chấm luôn rồi bỏ xa bìa nhá mình cho bẹp bòn chẳng xong được nông ca chấm bìa nhập bên y tế đối chứ này khi vô tha ta nhị tế vị thi bùi ná đầy đầy trời ảnh vọt nhập bên y chìa chấm nọt môi đầy ông chấm luôn chấm bìa ai xâm rạch đại chí chăn tiên được sợ đồng bò ông chấm luôn chấm bìa nông ca xâm rạch thật ta ai cả sao nó để cho bẹp bòn từ lư nít tệ vị thi này đầm nà ca sao nà ca này về này nu bài hát thả ca cầm nát robot sao bây nhà cái lò mỏ cứ đau từ lư để ca đầm nọ sai robot sao chắc làm sơ bằng kết trả anh chiêng ca bị nứt từ lư để ca sầm rách bằng bài kinh đầm nà ca nít tệ vị thi robot ăn chấm đông bình này này, đối chứ này, thưa ao ai cả xa tiền lái đại xã đại xã bia nhà lược là nửa bình này, mình cho bẹp bòn từ nông nghiệp tiểu thị nông nông bình bắc chợ bản này, hay ở vậy đại dương khi ông vô cứ tha, rồi viên ai cả xa để cho bẹp bòn từ nông để cả đầm nọ sải hay nông để cả xem lại bài bài cách đồng nai cái này tệ vị thì đại biện lê dương y mà rồi mà phải buồn đi suốt tha tao dương cụ anh ở vọt tam để cả đồng nọ sải rư muối co anh ở vọt tam ai cả sa y mà rồi phải buồn nông cạn này đã miền đồng nọ khné nô nếu chỉ chậm nói muối đại kim vô khơi tha đồng nai cái này ca sớm sửa ban cửa lòng phật tử hỏi hỏi để ca đầm nọ sải nu mình men chỉ cô sầm khăn sầm rập đầm nà ca sầm nà ca nó bền đi tê hỏi ăn chấm nôm chấm nè nó bền đi cứ miên chăn tiền được sứt dạng bứt bạc cát đầm bay sầm rập bầm bay nơi cạnh đầm nà ca này tê vị thí ní hỏi đối chứ này ca cầm nát từ lư vẽ này mui này mui này đầm nai cái này tệ vị thí vì chỉ riêng chạm bạch đại ai sầm rúa đo đầm nai cái này hay được chưa này ông chấm nôm chấm rẻ từ cái cầm nát thà ta ai cả xa đại xã phía nhà lược dục máu này miên ai cả xa nát lá đại cho bẹp bòn sầm rập đầm nai cái này bên này hai đại tử thưa các đại đạo đồng bị xoay rốt cá bứt âm pi ai cả sa tiếng ồn luôn từ pi tiệt tôn từ nâng cô ca chỉ rùm mùi tiết đại dương ban sập lư nông địa pe pi thay ngay đại sa phía nhà ban lược lắng hạ đôi chỉ trong bằng hai thà mê thứ vi cà pi cô ta bằng hai nữ ai cả sa cà pi bọc luôn đôi giờ sạp về nhà bàn lướt ông pi sai video 
รบบลูกเชียวสมพรได้หนีอมปีชมูรบบกอดชมูอปุกมาได้รบบกอดเจ็ดดามปีมาสั่นใบนี้ได้ลูกบ้านมาเจ้าท่ามีนาดังเตคือมีนเหมือนเดิมเหมือนเนี้ยในขนมนี้คือลูกเชียวสมพรได้ดังไอ้ดอปอนมีนบ้านอมปีปัญหาเดือดจอบเปียปอนตัวหนึ่งใส่วิดีโอในเจ็ดดามการเลือกแบบนี้หาโดยเฉพาะบ่มเพลเจ้าในตัวนิตีรบบสหประชาชนขนมกาบังฮันพอตังได้ลงมีนพีเรียจีเนียบังฮันพอตังจมพูเรื่องกระไดนี้มันเมนมันเมนจุนจับเจ้าจีเนียเติร์บังฮันพอตังดอกบรรทุกนุตีจึงเลือกนาดมนางสาปริยาบังฮันพอตังมันบานเลือกปีวิมาเตสังไซเตจึงกาชลายตอบรบบพิกีจุนจับเจ้าคือมันเติร์กาตีมันจำบัตตีจึงกตปกเกรบบสหประชาชนคือมันอาจรวมลงบานนู้คือบรรทุกในการบังคับพอตังนี้ได้มันเติร์เต้เมาจนจับจอดไว้ตีปัจจุบันสมอคุณเดชาเปรีเล็กเล็กยิมสมจูนสหประชาชนบังคับตามไปบังคับต่อ Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Bonjour, Mesdames et Messieurs de la Chambre. Compte tenu des, du temps euh, qui nous est imparti, je vais essayer d'être brève sur les quelques points qui nous semblent importants de devoir être clarifiés. Je vais répondre en fonction des différents thèmes qui ont été abordés par les coprocureurs, mais je tiens d'abord à souligner un point qui a été évoqué par mes précédents confrères, à savoir qu'il n'a jamais été en question de mettre en doute le fait que vous êtes des juges professionnels capables d'apprécier la valeur probante des documents qui vous ont soumis, mais pour moi, l'intérêt de ce type d'exercice auquel nous livrons depuis deux jours, c'est bien de vous permettre, dans la masse prodigieuse de documents qui vous est soumis, d'avoir un, une sorte de sélection, un tri préalable. Et je ne comprends pas l'intérêt de cet exercice si ce n'est pas ça. Je précise... Également, puisque c'est un reproche qui nous est fait euh, de l'autre côté de la barre, que ce soit euh, de la part des parties civiles ou de la part des coprocureurs, à savoir que euh, nous aurions tendance, du côté de la défense, à mettre en avant la valeur probante des documents plutôt que le, les recevabilités. Et là, je pense que c'est important d'en revenir au texte, puisque euh, le premier jour, le coprocureur national s'est étendu sur la question. Textuel. Je rappelle que enfin, la règle 87.3 du règlement intérieur euh, précise, bien sûr, euh, liste un certain nombre d'éléments par rapport à la recevabilité des documents. J'attire votre attention sur un point particulier, cas 2. La règle 87.3a parle des documents qui sont dénués de pertinence. Nous avons effectivement euh, présenté des objections en application de ce texte, mais il y a aussi un autre point qui est extrêmement important, qui est le 87.3c, dans lequel on parle de documents, enfin, d'objections de, de, d'irrecevabilité pour euh, des preuves insusceptibles de prouver ce qu'elles sont, ce, pour, de, pardon, pour des documents qui sont insusceptibles de prouver ce qu'il entend démontrer, ce qu'il entend établir. Et ça, c'est un élément extrêmement important parce que c'est vrai que lorsqu'on parle de documents insusceptibles de prouver ce qu'il entend établir, c'est vrai que la frontière est minime avec la valeur probante, mais en tout état de cause, c'est prévu par le règlement intérieur et c'est en application de cet article 87.3c que nous avons fait également un certain nombre d'objections. Pour nous permettre d'apprécier ces deux éléments, la pertinence et euh, ce que le document est susceptible euh, de prouver et de ce qu'il entend établir, on est obligé de se référer à la raison pour laquelle les coprocureurs les présentent devant vous. Et la raison pour laquelle les procureurs les présentent devant vous a été exposée 
à la fois ils y avons fait référence dans les documents introductifs à leur liste, euh, euh, bar 31, et également figure dans le cadre de colonnes euh, dans leurs annexes spécifiquement, puisque la manière dont sont présentées euh, ces annexes, vous avez la description du document, vous avez la cote du document et puis vous avez une dernière colonne où on vous renvoie à la partie pertinente de l'ordonnance de clôture à laquelle se réfère le document. Et il est évident que nous, du côté de la Défense, nous avons préparé nos objections en fonction également de ce qui est présenté par euh, le pro les coprocureurs comme étant ce qu'ils entendent établir, puisque c'est ce qui va nous permettre d'apprécier euh, la, la, la la recevabilité en application de l'article 87 3C. Alors, sur la question de la pertinence, mon confrère l'a rappelé, mes confrères précédents aussi euh, l'ont indiqué, euh, il ne s'agit pas aujourd'hui euh, pour la défense de limiter euh, de notre propre chef euh, le, le champ euh, du procès, euh, du mini-procès euh, numéro 1. C'est en application d'une décision de votre chambre, d'une décision de votre chambre, l'ordonnance de disjonction. E124, mais également qui a été précisé par votre euh, décision rejetant la demande euh, de réexamen euh, des coprocureurs, E124 barre 2. Et vous avez dans ce dernier document, comme l'a évoqué hier, euh, le co-avocat des, des partis civils, vous avez précisé à le champ précisément des éléments qui seraient à examiner dans le cadre de ce mini-procès et vous avez indiqué en annexe les paragraphes et les parties qui feraient l'objet de ce procès. Et c'est en application de vos indications que nous avons également formé nos objections par rapport à la pertinence. Et j'ai envie de dire, encore une fois, euh, que euh, cette, euh, ce, vos décisions euh, sont en contradiction aujourd'hui avec la position euh, des coprocureurs telle qu'ils l'ont développée ces derniers jours. Mais j'ai envie de dire, ils sont également en contradiction avec leur position dans la description de leurs annexes et dans la fameuse colonne dont euh, je parlais tout à l'heure, dans laquelle ils indiquent pour quelle, euh, pour quelle euh, partie de l'ordonnance de clôture euh, ces documents sont pertinents et pourquoi ils entendent présenter ces documents. Et je ne vais pas rentrer dans les détails parce qu'encore une fois, le, le temps euh, me semble court, mais je peux vous indiquer qu'il y a au moins 317 documents, et c'est sûr, en fonction de ce que disent les coprocureurs eux-mêmes, parmi toutes les annexes, qui ne sont absolument pas concernées par le procès, par le procès numéro 1, par les paragraphes retenus dans votre décision E124-2. Et là, je suis obligé de noter un petit peu comme vient de le faire mon confrère Carnavas, que j'ai assisté à un glissement qui m'apparaît troublant de l'argumentation des coprocureurs. Parce que notamment en ce qui concerne les documents S21, on a eu de longs développements qui, effectivement, s'apparentent à de la plaidoirie sur le fond, mais je passe sur ce point, mais surtout euh, qui n'a rien à voir avec ce qui a été annoncé à la fois dans le document euh, E9 bar 31, mais également dans la dernière colonne des annexes sur la raison pour laquelle les coprocureurs entendaient utiliser ces documents. Donc aujourd'hui, on nous a présenté de nouveaux arguments, encore une fois, qui s'apparentent plus à des arguments de fond, et à mon sens, ça n'enlève ne, ça ne, absolument pas le manque de pertinence que nous avons soulevé du côté de la défense. Par ailleurs, euh, un élément qui est important, qui a été soulevé à la fois par les parties civiles et par les coprocureurs, euh, il y a une, un argument selon lequel, comme vous avez indiqué que le champ euh, euh, de, de ce mini-procès pourrait éventuellement euh, être étendu, que dans ces conditions, il était, plus, il était préférable de euh, euh, retenir l'ensemble euh, des documents qui ont été présentés pour l'ensemble euh, du procès. Là, j'ai un, un vrai problème de méthode. Vous avez indiqué dans votre décision 172, page 4, 
que pour le moment, vous n'aviez pas l'intention de revenir. Euh, Excusez-moi pour les références, E72, page 4, évidemment, en français. Je suis désolé, je n'ai pas les références dans les autres langues. Mais vous, dans ce document dans lequel vous rejetiez la nouvelle demande euh, d'extension euh, des sites de crimes des coprocureurs, euh, vous avez bien précisé que, de toute façon, euh, vous, invite, enfin, vous informeriez les parties en temps utile euh, d'une éventuelle modification et dans ces conditions, en temps utile, cela voudra dire aussi que les parties, s'il y avait besoin d'amender les documents à présenter en fonction de ces nouveaux champs, auraient la possibilité de euh, présenter euh, les documents qui seraient utiles à ce nouveau champ. Je profite de cet élément puisque euh, C'est dans votre mémo E172 que vous avez répondu euh, à la requête des, des, des coprocureurs. Une petite parenthèse pour... Euh, alors c'est vrai que j'interviens en tant qu'avocat de Kyo Sampan, mais également euh, mon expérience a fait quand j'ai euh, travaillé devant d'autres juridictions internationales. Et euh, c'est vrai que la mémoire judiciaire est importante. Et je trouve euh, dommage que... Euh, des décisions à des requêtes qui ont été présentées publiquement n'est euh, pas, euh, pas de réponse particulière, n'est pas de décision euh, en tant que telle, mais simplement des paragraphes au sein de mes mots. Je trouve que pour les, pa les praticiens euh, euh, de la matière, pour les chercheurs et pour le public, euh, il serait beaucoup plus euh, intéressant d'avoir de réelles décisions. Euh, C'est une remarque en passant, j'espère que nous aurons l'occasion d'y revenir, mais encore une fois, je pense que la mémoire judiciaire et les archives judiciaires des euh, chambres euh, extraordinaires au sein euh, des tribunaux cambodgiens euh, méritent cela. Je vais brièvement passer sur la question euh, des originaux et de la fiabilité des documents obtenus par des CECAM. Vous avez euh, assisté aux euh, déclarations, aux dépositions euh, des témoins Chang Yuk et Vatandara. Euh, je vous renvoie à leur déposition. Euh, je rappellerai simplement une citation par rapport hein, aux archives nationales de M. Vatandara aux transcriptions françaises. E1 barre 30.1 pages 84 et 85 dans lesquelles il indique notamment et bien je cite les documents provenant des archives nationales étaient déjà des photocopies quand nous les avons obtenues donc je pense que la question des originaux et de comment euh, ces euh, documents sont arrivés aux archives nationales reste entière et il faut donc se méfier des raccourcis de l'accusation en ce qui concerne la supposée fiabilité absolue des documents qui ont été fournis par des CK. Très brièvement, également un autre point à propos des documents relatifs aux actes et comportements de l'accusé. Là, nous, nous, nous renvoyons la Chambre à, à nos écritures O 96 bar 4 dans laquelle nous avions de façon extrêmement détaillée répondu sur toutes les références aux articles 92 bis et 89 c des tribunaux pénaux internationaux et je m'associe sur ce point évidemment au développement que vient d'effectuer mon confrère Carnaval sur ce point un autre point qui me paraît aussi important d'être précisé, euh, c'est la question des nouveaux documents. Euh, du côté des, co des coprocureurs, on a euh, soulevé que euh, notre notion de nouveaux documents ne correspondait pas à ce qu'avait indiqué la Chambre. Et pourtant, là, je me réfère hein, euh, à la décision euh, de, à votre mémorandum du E172 barre 5, paragraphe 7, dans laquelle vous indiquez bien que les nouveaux documents seraient examinés à une date ultérieure. Et il n'a jamais été euh, la position de la défense de Kyo d'indiquer que nous parlions de nouveaux documents au sens de la règle 87.4 du règlement intérieur, mais simplement au niveau de la règle 80.3 euh, euh, C'est un élément euh, qui est important et qui, à mon avis, trouve une explication euh, extrêmement claire. Pour preuve, dans notre liste 209 bar 1.1, à partir de la page 21, nous avons fait figurer 34 nouveaux documents qui ont été spécifiquement exclus de la discussion par la Chambre dans son mémo 172 bar 5, 
Paragraphe 3, puisque dans les faits, elle n'a évoqué que 78 documents plus euh, en écartant euh, comment, de 10, euh, 10 documents qui avaient déjà été examinés et en mettant de côté la, les, les 34 nouveaux documents qui avaient été listés euh, par la défense de Kusampan. De la même façon, les partis civils avaient communiqué une liste de nouveaux documents dans leur euh, document E109-2.3 et ces nouveaux documents ne sont pas concernés par cette audience. Dans ces conditions, euh, je rappelle que l'annexe 21, qui est une compilation L'annexe 21 des coups procureurs, qui est une compilation de nouveaux documents, fait également partie de ces nouveaux documents. Ce n'est pas moi qui ai intitulé cette annexe ainsi. Elle fait partie de ces nouveaux documents pour lesquels la Chambre a prévu qu'ils seront examinés ultérieurement. Je passe rapidement parce que je vois que le temps est compté. Euh, une brève observation en ce qui concerne l'annexe numéro 15. Euh, Monsieur le procureur, procureur international Abdoulak a... Ah, ok. Excusez-moi, il paraît que je parle trop près du micro. Excusez-moi. L'annexe numéro 15... Donc, concernant les cartes et photos, à ce propos, le co-procureur international Abdoulak avait indiqué, que, avec un argument quelque peu contestable, que nous n'avons pas, pas objecté à chacun des documents, que nous avons cité que quelques exemples et qu'il faudrait comprendre que nous acceptons l'ensemble de ces documents. C'est un argument encore une fois, qui me paraît euh, déplacé, dans la mesure où, très précisément, l'objet de ces audiences était de discuter annexe par annexe, de façon générale, euh, les objections, et qu'il n'était pas dans l'intérêt euh, d'une euh, bonne administration de la justice que nous passions notre temps à évoquer un par un tous les documents. Je pense que c'est important de faire cette précision, que ça soit clair et qu que ça soit bien clair que nous avons à chaque fois cité des exemples pour illustrer la question. Très brève remarque également euh, concernant l'annexe 16 et notamment la vidéo euh, dont les références sont D313.9R et ensuite point 10R et ensuite point 11R. Là encore, mon confrère a évoqué la question brièvement. Je dois dire que j'ai trouvé effectivement l'interpellation de mon client comme un procédé peu élégant. La démonstration de Monsieur le procureur international hier m'a semblé quelque peu vaine. Il ne s'agissait pas pour nous, du côté de la défense, de nier que c'était bien Monsieur Kusampan qui apparaissait à l'écran. L'objet de notre objection était de dire nous ne savons pas dans quelles conditions et nous, les coprocureurs ne le savaient pas non plus. Ils l'ont indiqué eux-mêmes en présentant le document. D'où venait euh, euh, cette vidéo, dans quelles conditions elle a été effectuée, qui interrogeait M. Kusampan, et surtout, malheureusement, euh, puisque ce document euh, n'est qu'en Khmer et ça fait partie d'une des objections, je ne suis pas en mesure de savoir exactement la teneur euh, de, de, de cet entretien. Tout ce que je sais, c'est qu'il y a eu un montage, il y a eu un découpage dans ces conditions. Notre objection tient absolument, il n'a jamais été question de dire que ce n'était pas M. Kusampan qui figurait sur cette vidéo. Un point aussi euh, de précision en ce qui concerne l'annexe 17. Euh, monsieur le coprocureur -co -co international de Vild a euh, euh, soulevé une apparente contradiction en disant que nous nous objections à euh, certaines communications internationales euh, sur, euh, en réponse sur les archives françaises et euh, nous a quelque peu euh, interpellé en disant que sur notre propre liste de documents, nous avions nous-mêmes listé euh, des documents euh, des archives françaises du ministère des Affaires étrangères. Je tiens à rappeler, et ça c'est un élément important qui vient d'être soulevé euh, par mon confrère Carnaval, que nous avions à ce moment-là proposé notre liste de documents qui venait en rapport avec des témoins que nous souhaitions voir entendus par la Chambre. Et là, je rappelle, je renvoie à nos documents, notre liste, euh, le document E9-29.2 et E109-1.1 et notamment 
les déclarations euh, également annoncées de, euh, du témoin TCW 56, TCW 56, dans le document E9-11.2, dans lequel nous indiquons que ces témoins évoquera, je cite, les archives du ministère des Affaires étrangères françaises disponibles depuis 1975. Donc là encore, l'idée c'était pour la défense de Kyosanpan à chaque fois de présenter des documents en perspective avec les témoignages euh, d'une personne que nous souhaitons voir entendue par la Chambre. Euh, c'est une démarche qui est différente. Alors, c'est vrai que le type d'exercice auquel nous nous livrons, nous présentons des documents avant même que des témoignages interviennent. Je pense, comme mon confrère Carnavaz est certainement euh, dû euh, à une expérience devant d'autres juridictions, que euh, c'est quand même plus intéressant pour vous, encore une fois, dans le rôle que nous, nous euh, donnons au niveau euh, de, cette, de, de, de cette audience, à savoir défendre nos clients, euh, certes, et vous donner les éléments de les juger correctement. Et en fonction euh, de ce devoir que nous avons, encore une fois, je, je le rappelle, je vous l'ai indiqué euh, lorsque je suis intervenu euh, pour présenter les objections, l'idée, c'est de ne pas vous faire partir dans le délibéré avec une tonne de pièces dans laquelle, dans, dans, dans laquelle vous devrez faire le tri, mais de vous donner des éléments à chaque fois qui vous permettent de mettre ces documents en perspective en application euh, de, 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 de votre devoir de juger les accusés devant J'en aurais terminé et je vous remercie du temps, je pense, supplémentaire que vous m'avez accordé. Excusez-moi, Monsieur le Président, juste pour... Pour les besoins du procès verbal, il paraît que j'ai fait une erreur au niveau du témoin pour le ministère des Affaires étrangères français. C'est le témoin TCW 156 pour les besoins du transcript. ມາອົງ <coughs> 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 ក្រុមខានដល់អ្នកដទៃក៏ពុងតែធ្វើអធិបាយសូមបញ្ឈប់ជាបន្ទាន់ដោយការតិចជ័យរបៀបនេះជាមកសូមចាប់ផ្ដ